Thanks everyone for, for dialing in and joining us today on uh, our webinar on uh, Train Technologies, a EPMR customer success story. And uh, just wanted to uh, let you guys know real quick, uh, if you have any questions uh, along the way, uh, feel free to enter those directly into the uh, chat box in the Zoom webinar chat. All right, so we can go ahead and get going. So thanks everyone uh, for, for coming on. Um, hope everyone is well and uh, getting ready for the weekend. Uh, today on uh, our APM work customer success, success story. We're going to speak, speak to two really good friends of ours uh, from Train Technologies um, and get a better understanding of uh, what they uh, went through at uh, during our EPMware implementation. Um, and uh, we'll learn a little bit about uh, EPMware, how it was used uh, at Train, uh, and uh, hopefully give you guys a chance to uh, ask any questions about the implementation or why uh, maybe we did things a, a certain way. So, um, you know, thank you again for, um, uh, for joining us. So real quick, just some uh, housekeeping. Uh, what exactly is EPMware? Uh, for folks on the call, if you haven't uh, heard of us yet, uh, EPMware is a uh, cloud and on-prem um, metadata management and data governance uh, software solution. Uh, so we are pretty popular in the Oracle space and, um, you know, not only use on Oracle, it's a agnostic metadata management data governance solution, uh, but it's really meant for the business user to uh, get a little bit more visibility and control over their hierarchies. So um, the way EPM works typically use our customers will, uh, you know, users will log into the application, create a request for uh, metadata and uh, push that along through a data governance workflow uh, path and ultimately deploy it to their target applications. So EPMware is really meant to be source of truth for enterprise uh, metadata management. What we do a little differently is uh, we include uh, source and target adapters uh, to allow for synchronization uh, to uh, target applications that we support. So what we've seen commonly in the past is um, applications that allow for metadata management uh, kind of force you to create integrations to target applications. Um, and, and what we've seen is that sometimes, um, you know, we don't always create a seamless uh, a user experience from beginning to end. And so not only do we lose visibility of when metadata is created and when it's consumed by your subscribing applications, but uh, it leaves some room for error. And we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. So a little bit about uh, EPMware. We are uh, headquartered in Silicon Valley. We've got offices uh, in New Jersey, also in Mumbai. Um, as far as offerings go, uh, we do have a on-premise and a AWS uh, SaaS cloud offering. So uh, Im important to note that uh, both of the offerings have the same exact code base. Um, and uh, have the same exact set of features and functionality. So uh, it's kind of just a matter of going with the uh, offering that makes sense uh, for the organization. But in terms of being able to uh, connect to uh, any of your target applications, um, you have the ability to, uh, if you're using cloud, EPM or cloud, connect to uh, cloud and on-prem applications at one time. Uh, and even the other way around. If you're using on-prem, you can connect to cloud and on-prem at the same time. So uh, you can manage uh, easily a uh, hybrid landscape. And I think that's why a number of customers um, are, are happy to be with us. Uh, as far as consulting goes, uh, we work with a variety of different systems integrators um, in the US and uh, in, in Europe and in Asia. And um, you know, we also do a little bit of consulting on our own. Uh, internally. Uh, also, training and support uh, is available. So I haven't put an icon here, but um, we do have a, a class that's available on uh, KeyTeach. So if you go to keyteach.com, you can look up EPMware over there. And uh, there are a number of different running scheduled uh, dates. So, um, you know, we're super, super happy about what those guys have put out. It's a very excellent um, uh, training program. It's a two-day class, and I'll give you guys, uh, if you're interested, um, you know, very thorough set of um, 
information and a set of exercises that you can follow along um, uh, to get a, a better uh, hand on uh, EPMR. A little bit about uh, co company history. So we are uh, new to the space, but um, as far as experience goes, um, you know, all myself and uh, uh, our co-founders are, um, you know, thoroughly well versed in uh, Oracle Hyperion ERP and uh, EPM space. So um, again, uh, my personal background, I've uh, been in Hyperion for quite some time um, and also SAP. I've also been a consultant for, for quite some time as well. Um, and I think the way EPMware originally started was to um, you know, personally experience the gap that we've seen in, uh, in this space. And um, what we wanted to do was make sure that customers were able to manage metadata by, by bringing what they, how they used to interact with creating metadata and also being able to have that metadata validated and seamlessly pushed out to a target application um, uh, achieved. And originally, uh, EPMR started off on a whiteboard um, and uh, was completely built out from scratch based on you know our experiences uh, in the ERP and EPM space. And so you know you can see how kind of grown from from on prem into creating a cloud platform. And of course, strategically now 2020 and uh, beyond, uh, we're rapidly expanding into uh, other target applications outside of uh, Oracle. So we're heading out into the into the one stream world into the anaplan world um salesforce workday so there's a lot of uh different uh, integrations that our customers are asking for and um you know uh, successfully made the transition out of uh consulting and into uh software so while it has its challenges i wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for anything in the world so focus of uh epm where really has been um having accessible, accurate, and, and trustworthy metadata. Uh, and going through implementation over and over again, um, what we've seen is that metadata is uh, commonly, when, when not governed and when not managed, uh, leads to discrepancies in uh, data across financial applications. And it's really one of the worst things that you can experience. And you know, we'll, we'll talk about that on the, on the call today. Um, uh, what EPMware really strives to do here is to, is to make sure that the metadata that a user requests, whether it's an end user or whether it's a uh, target application uh, that's consuming metadata, um, there really is uh, as much functional and technical validation uh, that's been done prior to um, pushing that metadata out to the target apps. And what we've seen is you know, very commonly, metadata really isn't vetted out until it hits the target application and then data is loaded against it. And then we realize at that point that the data is different um, in one application and another when it should actually be intact. And so that's where, you know, we lose, um, you know, trust with the business when, uh, you know, simple things um, are, are not caught. And that's really where uh, EPM more strives to bring that, you know, the, the focus of real time validations, you know, to the forefront uh, of the request process. Right, just a few of our customers, um, you know, you can see here, I won't spend time really going through it. Obviously, we're going <laughs> to talk extensively about uh, train technologies today. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll be uh, publishing this webinar webinar. Um, you know, later on. So if you guys are, you know, uh, interested in hearing a little bit more about these, uh, you know, always uh, feel free to give us a shout um, through epmware.com. So our traditional request process that we've seen um, before implementing EPMware, um, you know, it starts off at end user. Um, it, it goes through a number of different steps and stages. So here you can see how many you know, different paths your typical requests might take. And we can see that, you know, you really lose sometimes uh, time efficiency uh, by, by having a request kind of go back and forth. Uh, you know, before implementing EPMware, 
um, you know, a lot of our customers are, are using a combination of different request methodologies like email or, you know, uh, SharePoint or Excel or, you know, just, you know, maybe pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, I added this member. Can you add this member into, you know, your hierarchy? And so that's where that that trail of, um, you know, back and forth messaging um, can uh, lead to some errors. So, you know, typically it goes to an admin, maybe an EPM admin and, you know, back and forth from a user to a manager um, before finally having, uh, you know, maybe multiple admins or users added to their target applications. And so, you know, why we might make it there successfully some of the times, um, you know, there, there are complexities like managing alternate hierarchies um, and uh, making sure that certain properties are uh, properly flagged, uh, like UDAs or aliases, and, and flagged consistently across applications. And that's where, um, you know, we kind of get tripped up sometimes and it leads to issues or errors. So in EPM where uh, we kind of give you a more controlled and governed change process where uh, EPM where acts as the central hub and spoke uh, for applications, um, regardless of what their technology type is. And, and very commonly what we see is um, not all metadata is always authored directly in EPMware. I mean, most customers will uh, create EPMware as a central hub and spoke for most dimensions like the chart of account segments. Uh, and users will, will log into EPMware, they'll see what their production hierarchy looks like, and then they will automatically, uh, uh, they'll create requests and that request will map out across the multiple applications they need. Now, if metadata needs to be authored outside of EPMware and EPMware just needs to be the recipient of that metadata, we can easily create a, uh, an ad hoc or scheduled feed um, on a nightly basis or a weekly basis, whatever it is, just to bring that one dimension in. And like typically it, it might be like a customer dimension or uh, an employee dimension that's automatically fed in uh, and uh, um, enriched through a lights out process and then pushed out to target applications. But in most cases, customers will really log in and, and create change uh, by looking at their hierarchy structure. Once that's submitted in the EPM where that goes through our workflow and governance process, um, where users who are responsible for uh, making change or enriching change within the request are able to create a, um, uh, either an enrichment to the current request or simply just sign off on the request and say, yeah, this looks good. We can keep this moving to the next level. And so you can incorporate multiple different teams uh, in your workflow and your governance process. But you can be sure that you know, when that request is initially created, we've hit already the, the technical and the functional validations uh, that are applicable uh, to your enterprise. Um, and so that the admin isn't forced to remember and change the request or communicate back and forth you know, 15 or 20 times to make sure that they've got all the information they need. So the user is able to act in a more self-service um, uh, process to be able to say, you know, this is the, this is the member I need. This is where I need it to roll up. Or you can also allow other teams to interact with that and say, you know, this member was created now send it off to a different team and have them place that member in the correct alternate hierarchy that they needed to be in. And so, um, takes a significant just process burden off of um, the metadata management team. All right, so uh, target adapters that we currently uh, support, uh, really see a lot of Oracle here, of course, and um, you know, Anaplan, Workday, Salesforce, SAP, OneStream, uh, Power BI, and so on. So we're, we're continuously adding um, you know, more and more functionality uh, through integrations of these adapters. Of course, you don't have to use these adapters. You can always manage these hierarchies and push metadata out to um, a flat file or to an interface table, or you know, maybe just create a view on the outbound side. Uh, but again, it's uh, pretty flexible, of course. It's, it's very simple to um, connect to one of these applications and to pull your hierarchies in uh, and to manage them going forward. But what we, what we do include here is 
uh, not only the plug and play functionality, but the out of the box validation logic. Uh, so that saves a considerable amount of time during the implementation phase. It allows you to really get up and running and say, you know, now we can focus on the governance policies uh, of the organization and how do we layer this into a proper uh, workflow so that it's, um, you know, it creates this seamless metadata experience. All right, so just give you a quick um, walkthrough of what that uh, EPMware interface looks like. Um, I'm here, I'm just going to log in and we'll spend five minutes just to uh, show you what this looks like. Logging into EPMware and you can see the um, SSO uh, also available so we can integrate via SAML 2.0. Here you can see that um, we've got our EPMware dashboard and on the left we've got all our uh, different modules. Of course these can be controlled with, um, uh, with security. Um, but here on the left you can see our Explorer which is more of just a metadata browser. You can click on a, um, an application and uh, from here, we'll just open up a, an HFM app. Here we go. And you can see that you can, you can browse the hierarchy and you can see all the different properties that are available. Of course, you can organize these properties any way you want in, in categories. Um, and on the left, you can see that there are members here in red and gray. Uh, members in red are actual active members in EPMware. So users have created those, but EPMware hasn't deployed them out to the target app. So we keep a, you know, a running visual version uh, of what change uh, is actively uh, being interacted with in the tar in this application, but you can also see what's active in your production application as well. Here on the property side, you can always add um, properties that are custom and support your intake form process. And I think we'll be talking to uh, Lisa and Jamin shortly about you know how we we also created a, a custom set of properties to be able to tag. Uh, and, and have users populate custom questions um, in EPMware so that we can we move off of SharePoint and go into uh, a validated intake form process. So as far as uh, creating a request in EPMware, you'll see this uh, request screen. And um, if you populate simple due date, a description, priority, and we're able to select a workflow, let's go down to this one right here, hit the save button. And I can show you how I can initiate a change. So I go here to my application, I pick my dimension, and my production application will populate. And as soon as I go here, I can right click and I can see the list of transactions that are available. So in order to create change here, I'm simply just going to click create a member as a child and I can do uh, Create a member, and of course, this hits me with a first validation. So, just a real simple example of what a you know out of the box validation is like. Of course, if we want to uh, layer in you know member name alias validations, very easy to do so. It's out of the box, and it'll just start running. Uh, but again, you can take this and, and customize this new member uh, intake form process to to fit what works for your organization. Right. So let's come in here, create brand new member that's unique. And now EPMware creates that. And of course, all of our properties are uh, available to be managed. Now again, we can hide some of the more technical properties based on who the end user is that's going to uh, create change here. And we can allow admins to only see these and, and populate them. But again, here down at the bottom, we've got an activity log that'll track all the different changes. And up here, we can see that our first line was created. And of course, what EPMware did was it created a second line automatically in the ASO queue. So this is how EPMware creates dimension mapping between one application and another. And it allows you to create a change in one application and then also have other applications source off of that change. So you have one request one change, but it's impacting multiple different subscribing applications for what that target is. And you can see here that this is uh, going to impact uh, what the ultimate impact to all of your target applications are going to be based on the level of change you're going to make, right? 
So now uh, once I'm ready, I can simply submit this into the workflow. Uh, and that's where our governance process uh, will take over and allow us to monitor that in the dashboard. So um, that's uh, just a short version of um, what EPM Word does and, and how it works. And, and of course, um, you know, we're happy to kind of walk you through a more detailed version, but I want to let uh, our superstars on the phone kind of have a chance to uh, tell you what life really is like with EPMware. So, um, you know, without further ado, I'd like to welcome you guys to uh, Lisa Poche um, and Jamin Menger um, at Train Technologies. And, um, you know, Lisa, I'll let you say hi and do a quick 30 seconds or <laughs> as long as you want on, on the intro on yourself. <laughs> Um, I'm Lisa Poche, um, formerly of the financial systems team. Uh, at the time of this project that we did in 2018, I was responsible for uh, system enhancement projects, uh, development, and the customer support team uh, and owned the metadata management process. So, um, and Jamin, you can introduce yourself. He worked for me. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm Jamin Menger. I work in the APM space from the last 10 years. And from the metadata perspective on the APM where I was uh, part of the project end to end, where we try the business requirement, uh, bounce out the new ideas, how to implement each and every kind of logic builder scripts and automations. So that was my part in this uh, project. So I'll talk a little bit about um... Train Technologies. We've recently split off uh, from Ingersoll Rand. Um, at the time of our project, we were Ingersoll Rand. Um, and since then, we have become Train Technologies, which is a global manufacturing company that focuses on commercial HVAC, residential HVAC, and transportation solutions uh, like um, refrigerated trucks and trailers, train applications. Um, there's also some air um, under the brands train and Thermo King. And our mission is to solve sustainability challenges through innovation in heating and cooling. And we have some, some large sustainability goals that go along with that, the gigaton challenge, et cetera. So it's, it's a pretty exciting time to work for train technologies. There are a lot of um, big goals going on in the in the environmental space. So um, I'm here today to, to explain to you what uh, it was like pre EPMware, and then I'll pass it over to Jamin who will talk about the project and um, and what it is like now. Uh, I'll be around though to answer questions uh, about, you know, how uh, we landed if if there anything if there anything that comes up there, so historical landscape at the time when we uh, reached out to EPM where we had five Hyperion applications we had um, one HFM application with for global consolidation we use um, FDMEE to bring in uh, data from mostly uh, R12, EBS, uh, but also in, in smaller locations, uh, local um, ledgers uh, through FDMEE to, the, to a staging area, which is described down below. It's a SQL staging area, which controls uh, data mapping between the different applications. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. But we had an S-based cube called the report cube, which is sort of a, a mega cube, which houses all the different uh, sources of data. So you can see our GL, not full detail GL, but not drill through, but uh, GL data type, HFM data type, uh, planning data type. And so for that reason, um, or some of the challenges that we have are related to difference in level of granularity between those different applications. So in planning, uh, we have two, two major applications with multiple cubes. Um, and I'll, again, I'll get back into that in a second. Um, we used SharePoint and Excel templates to uh, request changes to metadata, and we used DRM for that so, uh, as well. So um, I will, let's just flip to the next slide, and I'll go into just a little bit of a deeper dive on that. Um, so uh, within that environment, uh, we had one full-time person dedicated 100% to just metadata management. So an enterprise control um, designee for all 
of the chart changes. And we, we govern that process also for the R12 application, although we don't um, currently target uh, updates to the R12 application is perfectly capable of doing that, and it's probably something that we're we're doing, hopefully soon. Um, it's a it's an area of opportunity for us, but it's it's perfectly capable of doing that. And I know that there are some other companies like Oppenheimer that that did that. Um, our our challenge really was around the time, the cycle time. So to do end to end, we were really taking we were busy for the whole month, four weeks, to make metadata changes from the request all the way to deployment was was four weeks and it involved a lot of constituents like um, not only the metadata manager but um, that that resource was also scripting and DRM so um, from the time of the request that comes in through a um, an Excel template through SharePoint not only scrubbing the request for quality um, but also coding the 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 request and then deploying it to the different test applications. And um, then we had a, we have a customer support team that was responsible for QA. And then we would pass that per, to the production team and the production team would do their checks again, uh, recheck everything and then, um, you know, deploy it to production. So that's the kind of an end to end cycle that took, took quite a bit of time. Um, and Jamin will speak a little bit more later about the, the cycle time reductions that we've been able to achieve. Um, some of the challenges again were related to the different application types that have different levels of detail so we don't have our full chart of accounts um, in the planning application for example because we want to limit um, the insanity in terms of um, kind of the the you know illusion of precision or ability to be precise in, in forecasting. So we have a, a different level of detail in our planning application. For good reason, um, it was designed that way. However, it does introduce um, challenges between keeping your applications in sync. And I, I failed to mention that before, but within, within I think we have um, 12 dimensions overall, maybe 13, 14. So um, we don't manage, and we have an employee dimension, which is not managed through EPMware. Um, but all the other dimensions are, are now um, managed through EPMware. And so some of the, the challenges, especially on the ac account side or the product side, we don't want to have every single uh, account or product in every single application. And so that's, that's where some of that um, metadata synchronization challenges come into play. Um, in addition to that, the, the full-time resource that we had um, dedicated to, to the ECC, what we call the enterprise change control process, um, had to do manual validation on the request, scrub the request, verify that the properties that were scripted were correct. So they would script it and then load it into DRM. And then you still have to check in DRM to see if you, you, you did it right. Even though we had some templates to, to do that a little bit more quickly, we still had some challenges in terms of, you know, the exceptions and, um, we still have those, but, um, you know, there was also almost like an if then kind of flow chart checklist that that person had to have next to them to to say, OK, when when a request like this comes in, do I need to put in a corresponding input member or do I need to, um, you know, put this in every cube or where do I want to exclude this? And so all that was was very manual, which is is now built into EPMware and saves us a lot of time um, from a governance process perspective, like I said, we had an, uh, an Excel template that was attached to a SharePoint request. The SharePoint request was freeform though, so anybody could um, escalate it to any approver they wanted. Uh, so you would freeform select an approver and without necessarily, you know, like a custom workflow. So they would, if, if for example, something needed to flow through legal, um, it would be very easy for a requester to skip that step in the escalation process or the approval process. So um, you can't really do that kind of customization in SharePoint. I guess you can, but it takes a lot of, a lot of, it takes a SharePoint developer of which we did not have that skill set on our team. Um, and then on top of that, there were no email notifications. So um, you wouldn't necessarily know every time it, it, um, we had some email notifications, but it wasn't as fancy as what you get with EPMR, let's put it that way. Um, and then we had uh, multiple tools that we needed to 
load the formats. So we, and Jamin will talk more about that technical side later, but we, we would export the, the load formats into the different target um, applications as they needed. And um, there was a lot of um, prone for error. So let's put it that way. So next, there's another set, I believe. Um, okay. Um, so there, again, cumbersome um, Excel-based deployment process. So you'd have these manual uploads into um, DRM from those scripts that I mentioned. And then, uh, sorry, so then you take the export out of the DRM and you'd send it to the target applications. A very lengthy process in order to update all the dimensions. So if I, if I have um, 12 dimensions in a planning application and three cubes, and then you have um, another workforce planning cube and a report cube, it, it multiplies very quickly into um, tons of time to just load to your test applications. And then if you have to rework anything, if, if the QA process identified an issue, a, a property that wasn't correct, if it wasn't rolling up property properly, then, you know, you'd have to sort of batch it in order to reload those, those um, changes again in that lengthy process. So, you, you know, you'd have a lot of stopping and starting on the testing cycle, whereas, um, and I'm a little cheating a little bit to give you a, an eye into the future, but now, you know, if somebody comes back to the to the team and says, there's an, an issue, they can, you know, go back into EPM where fix that and redeploy quickly and that person can retest right away. So there's no, um, you know, really a much leaner process compared to, to what we had before. So. Um, so Lisa, did you, um, in, historically, did you have to limit the amount of changes that you would accept within a certain window? Actually, I'm glad I have actually a note on that. We, we, um, didn't really, we, we said we would, but we didn't often limit it. If, if somebody yeah. submitted a request for an alternate hierarchy that was 600 rows, we tried to um, call that a project and, and defer a little bit, but I can't really even count maybe more than one or two times in that environment that we really even did that. Um, but we, yeah. we were working with about 20 to 25 average requests a month. Um, and then we would freeze metadata on, on during earnings release uh, months so that we could um, avoid any, you know, mishaps. Although I, I don't think that that's necessarily really needed anymore. We, we really still do that. Um, during separation, though, we were upwards of, I think the worst month we had was something like 64 requests. And we were able to do that. I, I, I've said before, I don't think that we could have achieved that um, without EPMware. 60 mm -hmm. plus requests in a month, you know, even um, with a full time dedicated employee and, you know, all hands on deck, I, I don't think we could have with three developers even gotten to, to the, the volume of requests that we needed to do for, for the separation. Yeah. So, that's great to hear. Yeah. I'm glad we can yeah. help there. Yeah. So we'll turn it over to, to Jamin now. He'll talk a little bit more about, you know, um, we did select EPMware. We're not really going to talk through the, the selection process, but he'll talk about the project and, and what we've achieved. Sure. Thank you, Lisa. So on, on the EPMware implementation, these are kind of select, selection criteria slash advantages that we got. And basic like overall advantage was like to drive the productivity and the efficiency of the process itself so that we don't have kind of back and forth with the users or system related issues along the way uh, so uh we we are getting like a good uh, interface from the apm where user can see the hierarchies production hierarchy itself in the one screen and they don't have to go to smart or on any other tool set to see like how my production hierarchy looks like and what i'm changing they have all the information they need uh, on their screen through the cpmware interface so again on the governance side we have strong governance and we of course customize that we are going to talk about today like we customize each and every step from requester approver reviewer and also deployment and audit. So you have strong capability on like, if you want to see like what happened in that request in which system, which application, which member, which property, I can name it N number of the things, customized things. You can have those visibility in the one screen and you can see all the audit trail as well for that member or the request or the approver as well. You have like uh, instances in the past where the 
customer, the, the business user said, oh, well, but I requested this. And you're like, no, you didn't. I, <laughs> I yes, so that, that, that kind of things happen. And also like we, because of that, we introduce one more step in the workflow that I'm going to talk next, where yeah. we ask requester itself after the deployment, let's test your changes. So a uh, requester, they can che uh, check the, the request and all the changes in the target application itself and they can approve. So we have that kind of uh, governance process around that as well yeah. to make sure we are executing the right changes. And uh, behind the scenes on the front end, uh, this uh, like we have 50 plus logic builder script uh, as part of the design. And these are all PL SQL based uh, scripting, which runs the automation, customization, and also derivation. So all the magic happens in these 50 plus scripts behind the scenes. And uh, that's how it functions in each and individual steps or types of request. And as Lisa mentioned, like these are the five kind of uh, target applications that we have, have. And plus we have staging area where we have because of the different granularity of the details we have the mapping information between planning application and the reporting application and also hfm versus the reporting applications so we kind of manage the mapping itself in the epmware as well and we push that into the our, our staging area which is microsoft sql server next point and from the operation metrics perspective, as Lisa mentioned, I don't want to go through this again, but uh, this is the volume of the changes that we kind of execute today. And total, we have 180 PMware users. But again, we, we are doing a lot of changes or we are able to absorb a lot of changes versus past. So we can execute n number of the changes. Like one time I saw like we have like 1500 line of changes throughout the application and we are able to execute that into the systems. Next slide. So this is overall architect that we have. And of course it starts with the users, they submit the request and EPMware is we, uh, we have the cloud subscriptions, which is housed in AWS. And also like on the right hand side, it's our all target applications, which are Oracle and we have last staging area and it, uh, all of them, are using this EPMware adapter behind the scenes to execute the deployment. And again, we don't have to, as a customer, we don't have to deal with the adapter. It comes out of the box. So I'm not managing any kind of infrastructure related items regarding to the entire platform or even through the adapters or deployment perspective. I'm yeah, just one, maintaining one the important, configurations. Yeah, one, one important thing here too, was that like now you're, you're able to get that visibility of what what successfully deployed versus what failed directly from the EPM or deployment, right? Versus where I think you were like logging into the application and pulling logs out. Yes. To see like how, what failed or. Yes. And that, that's a pretty good point. Like we, we have on the deployment module where all the standard Oracle messages, which we get in our, let's say, Hyperion application, whether it's OAC or planning, those major messages comes in your screen or like in the logs in EPMware itself. So you, you are not going through each and individual apps and opening up the logs to fix the issue. Which is fun, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad that it's not happening all the time now because of the customization and the validation that we have. And this is kind of overview of our like standard workflow. And again, I just want to mention, this is not the only one workflow we have. We have multiple workflows based on our needs, but this is the standard workflow. If somebody is requesting a new account, product, location uh, for the standard dimension, we we ask user to select this standard workflow so it can get through this approval process. And in the first, uh, second screen, like this is like standard approval process that we have. It goes to different, different kind of departments and approvers. And one of the key uh, customization that we have is the first approver, which is the BU approver. What that means is, let's say if I'm part of the fine uh, FPNA team, 
and if I'm the requester, it, it will go to my manager, let's say Lisa, and it will go to her only instead of all the approvers in the system. So we kind of have that uh, plan of change or cha change request or like chain of appro approvals that we implemented here. So it won't bombard all the approvers with the emails that Jamin created this request, please approve. So that kind of customization we have done from the work, uh, workflow perspective. And after all these approvals are done, if you see the last, uh, the last uh, picture, you have the deployment stage where you go into the deployment module, which I'm going to show in my screenshot. And you can just click the button, select the request, click the button and you can deploy and it will take care of deployment into all the Hyperion applications. And after that, customer support comes in and test. They also get the email that, okay, requests are ready for the testing. They will, again, uh, review the request in target application. And after their approval, it goes to the end user, as I mentioned earlier, for their approval. So we make sure that we are not changing or accidentally we are not changing anything which we shouldn't. And then we are handing over to the operation team for the final kind of uh, moving to production, all the changes. So this is kind of end-to-end -end workflow, workflow, standard workflow that we have. We have another entity workflow, which is a big deal for us in our organization. Uh, if the new entity comes in, we have like, I think it's more than 30 or 40 approvals that we get to the different departments for that entity workflow. And also we have short workflow, which are, which is admin workflow, where we are not bugging any users for that. Let's say if, I'm, if I have to change the technical property or plan type in my PBCS application, I use the admin workflow and which is very quick, three or four step, and I can execute that change. So I'm not bugging the business approver or the requester for that because they don't care about this all technical properties that we maintain in the Hyperion systems. Next slide, please. Okay, so on the automation perspective, now I will go through like different, different flavor of automations that we have. First of all, we kind of went through the approach which a bit, little bit talked about is the master application approach where what that means is like we have one reporting application which, ha which drives all all changes in other applications. So that's the chain of action happens throughout the application. So we define that one report as a master application. If somebody makes the change and based on our automation, it replicate that change into a different application, whether it's HFM, PBCS, or another ASO cube, et cetera. Yeah, and, and this is actually super important because it's a like it's an architectural decision that um, train went through and you know, some folks decide to create like a, a centralized architecture where it's your traditional uh, rationalized chart or rationalized structure across dimensions. Um, and you can choose to do that. But again, sometimes it just, it makes sense when you have more end users that you're planning to uh, interact with the hierarchies. And sometimes you, if you give your hierarchy that's been rationalized and it has multiple different levels from different applications together um, for them to see and to create requests on, they don't get that this is a, an account hierarchy with you know five different applications worth of metadata. Yeah. It's very difficult for them to to yeah. you know pick that apart and put the member in the right place. And so that's where we see like, if if customers are going to go towards a process where they want um, the uh, transfer of ownership of metadata to be now towards the business, they're able to say, well, let's pick this one application that they're familiar with seeing, and then we derive change automatically off of that. So that's... Yeah, I, I think it's actually really worth reinforcing even more. I mean, we, we could never get a user to understand even how to answer the question, should this be included in this planning cube? Um, even if even a fairly savvy finance user would still not know how to answer those questions. Um, and, you know, with EPM where you can embed that into the request and by having the master, and I call that the mega cube, our reporting cube, which is, you know, like I said, it has this all of the source information in it. And maybe other companies want to, you know, choose to do just a, uh, you know, not a specific application for that, but just, you know, I don't know, you could call it 
it could be also just your main chart of accounts, right? It could be your EBS chart or whatever. Um, but I think it's, you know, one of the biggest advantages of EPMware is that you can um, control and, and ensure you can like sleep at night knowing that that person who's requesting it doesn't have to know all those answers. You don't have to train them um, to be, you know, you know, systems experts in order to put the request in their hands. Yeah, and with you, DRM, you could never, thing. ever do that. You could never do that with DRM. I, I said, oh, I got you recorded saying that now. So, <laughs> 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 Sorry, Jamin, back to you. Sure. Uh, and also on the property side, we have different, different mappings and the derivation, which is, for example, aliases, synchronization, like if that entity or location is in the, all the application, you just have to change the alias in one application and it will sync by itself. So we have those kind of automation. And also we automate like currency, you, currency default currency in HFM as well, which drives another synchronization, which I'm going to show you. And on the dimension side, again, you can drive the mappings and the derivations as we are saying, like you can add into one application, one dimension, and it will tickle into other applications. That's the dimension mappings and the derivations. And with that, you, the one step forward that we took is like you can create uh, automatic, you can create the input members that I'm going to show you as well. And as I mentioned on the workflow approvals, we have the workflow uh, business approval based on the business unit for the department so it goes to the right manager for that requester and we also have the approval for the legal team uh, based on the region i'm going to show you that as well but again all the information business related information key information we are getting at the point of the request so we don't have to chase the users to get this all request and we also have validation on top of that, like on submit validation where user cannot submit the request if, if they don't provide this information. So we have very kind of controlled uh, request, for, uh, request process where we get all the system related or the business, business related information on the front end itself, rather than going to the requester all the time. And of course that we talked about the deployment adapters, which we use for the OAC planning and HS, HFM, which comes out of the box. We don't have to configure anything. The only thing as a customer, I have to configure the initial application within the APM where, when I'm importing and that's it. After that, I don't have to worry about anything. APM where takes care of all the deployment or importing the hierarchies as well. So this is the one example I'm showing here for the location dimension mapping. As we keep mentioning that it, uh, we, we ask users to enter only in our report queue, which is our biggest cube, uh, ASO cube, where we have all the kind of data source or the data. So user comes in and creates the request, put all the information. And as you can see, they can select their business unit as well on the top after the workflow status where they can uh, they only have access to their department they select it and save the request and they add the location in this case i'm adding l4 1 2 3 4 5 location and as you can see in the request line it automatically generates the lines for the other applications so user only have to worry about one application that's it and what we did for the user training is like we create a short 30 seconds video for them which shows, uh, shows them what they have to do. And which is very fun for them, like to understand what is my process, how should I make the change? That's it, like they can just see the video and they can make their changes. And again, for the users, we, we only are making visible these four properties here, like member name, default parent member, and the aliases that they want. And as you can see in the alias, we, we have the rule where we put the member name dash and then alias description. So EPMware automation, which populates the member name itself. So user doesn't have to put the member name here. And also they can put the user comments here if they have any business reason and they can also attach any documentation they have as part of the request as well. So you, you are, 
kind of making sure all the supporting documentation, supporting details from the business perspectives are housed in this request. So we don't have to chase anybody for any kind of information for this request. And again, if you have more than four or five changes, you can do the bulk import as well, where you can house like whole like hundreds of changes in the Excel and just upload it. Next slide. This is another use case that we have, which is uh, PBCS input members, which we derive by this automation. Basically what happens is like in this case, I'm adding the function 19876 and system generates the input member for us. We don't have to create the member manually. So we created this automation where they will obviously help us to create this logic builder script and system creates all this input member for us. And we have full flexibility to disable this kind of automation if you want. And if you want to add more automation around that, we can do that as well so that we, we can manage our requirement. Basically, not all the organization have or reporting granularity in HFM or planning. You don't want user to plan on all the detail level in some organization like we. So we have higher level planning members, which goes uh, uh, goes for the like forecasting and AOP numbers. And then we use our mapping behind the scenes to load that into reporting applications. So like that, if you have any kind of customized requirement, you can tailor this automation by your requirement. Next slide. So as I said, like on the entity request, this is very kind of big deal for us if we are adding the new entity and certain information that we kind of track for the entities. Of course, as I mentioned, aliases for aliases, as I mentioned, like you can change the entity alias anywhere in the system. You can pick, let's say, you go into the HFM, HFM and if you change the alias, it will change for the other planning application and the reporting ASO application if that entity is available. So that you don't, as a user, they don't have to worry about the synchronization of the description or the aliases. Another key uh, automation we have is for the entities like we have one HR plan, which is headcount related information in one PBCS application and another ASO reporting application. And we don't load all the entities in those two applications. We only load the entities which has headcount in it. So from the requester perspective, we always used to go like, okay, as the requester is this entity has headcount or not. So I can make the decision in my head that I want to add into these two application or not, right? So which used to be very manual process. So we added that custom field here. And also we added the, automation here, which we again stress the EPMware uh, tool set where user provides that information. And as soon as they provide the information, yes, for that entity, system will generate the line and it will add those entities into HR plan and ASO applications. So we don't have to go to the user all the time to ask them this question is this entity has headcount or not system takes care of it and if user doesn't provide this information we don't allow them to submit the request so they have to say yes or no <laughs> so that is kind of uh, controlling the user behavior and as well as getting the right information from the system perspective which drives a lot of productivity from timing perspective yeah and this is very important even for for many of our other customers where they take that intake form and, you know, they're able to push this back on the users in real time and say, you know, if you haven't filled out these, these questions, these are custom properties or business justifications for that member, then you can't even submit the request. And that's been pretty popular because, you know, very commonly the, the game of tag that people play via email or back yeah. and forth forwarding spreadsheets is really where, you know, you have to like force these questions to be answered. Um, and while you can do it, you know, maybe an Excel and tailor like a, an Excel or a view or something to be able to get you uh, that forced answer here is just, you know, a central place going, you know, if you don't answer these questions, 
we're not moving forward. And that's kind of like started off as like training for you guys. Right. And then just people get used to it. Like, Hey, I guess I have to get this information before I even come in and submit this into the workflow. Yep. And uh, of course it drives a lot of productivity where you are not sending an email or talking to someone, you know, system gives you the message and they have to provide the information. Yeah. <laughs> so it's easier when the system says no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, uh, uh, can you go back? Uh, I want oh, to sorry, sorry, sorry. So, another key automation that we have on the entity perspective is we have, of course, we are operating in 20 plus countries as an organization. So, we have different legal departments. So, we have four legal departments one is North America, Latin America, EMEA, and Asia Pacific. So, before this, before EPM where we used to send the approval, approval for the, all the regions. But now what we have asked the user, give us the region, is this a North America entity? Then we will only send an approval email for the approval uh, to the North America department. We don't want to bombard the other regions with the emails like, it, it, they are not, they don't concern about the North America region entities, right? So they want to only approve their own region entities. So we also drive that automation here where user provides that region information and it will go to that particular legal department, which is also driving the kind of efficiency in the process for the approval, approval perspective. And another automation we have, as I mentioned, is for the default currency. So what happens is this application, which you are seeing here is HFM application, but we also have UDAs in PBCS application, which is currency UDA. So we kind of create a synchronization between the PBCS UDA and the default currency field in HFM. So those fields won't go out of sync, right? So you can pick and choose different properties across the application. And if you want to drive any synchronization, you can do that in, in EPMware. And you have full flexibility around that, which is very cool. Uh, to me, it's like from the system related properties, like if you are an admin, you are maintaining so many properties and you want to have automation, which takes care of your, all the rules, that's pretty good actually. Next slide. Okay, and here I just want to highlight the general kind of uh, high level uh, automation some slash validations that we have. So for member names, we, for example, for entity, we only allow five digit entity numbers. So if user is typing any bad numbers, we don't allow that. And also the prefix as well, we make sure they have right prefix. In our case, location start with L, product start with P. So in previous world, they don't even care about L and P and E letters or the numbering scheme that we have in the system. Here we have the automation slash validation, which takes care of that. And for example, in the first screen, I am adding L3 location into the L2 parents, which we don't allow. So, and the system generates this red box with the message, new member under the parent L2 must start with prefix L2, right? So that, that's kind of a small, small, what user may used to make the mistakes in our intake form in old world. We automated and created all the validation upfront when user is creating these members or creating this request. So at that kind of, uh, on the situation, like on submit situation, we run all this validation against member name and key information that we need from the user perspective, let's say for chart of account perspective, they have to have prefix A1, A2, A3 for certain roll up members. So we, we drive all kind of small, small detail validations at part of the on submit so that we have very complete request from the user. And we, we collect all the key information that we need to execute that request. Next slide. And after all this validation, all the reviews, admin reviews are done, we come to this deployment uh, module, which is pretty nice. It's a single, I would say, click 
single click operation where you can select your request and if you can you can select by request or set up by request by application by dimension however you want to execute your deployments but you have you have all the flexibility that's that's what i want to mention in our case what we did is like we execute by request so we select which request we want to deploy in our target application then we do the schedule and of course you have the calendar if you click next it will yep so you have the schedule as well where you can select your start date if you want to run one time multiple time every night you have full flexibility here and we schedule that uh, uh, deployment and after the deployment is done we kind of get this monitor screen where you can see the how the deployment went and here you have full kind of details from the logs perspective if the deployment is failed for example if somebody is in the outline in osc and if that outline is locked and it will obviously say the deployment status is failed and you can see in the log here itself that somebody is in the kind of uh, outline and it will show you the standard s based error message with the s based error ids and you can you can do your research from the logs perspective you also have files which are getting executed in the system as part of the deployment and usually this is the time that we uh, kind of experience is like 2 minutes for oac 2 minutes for planning or slash pbcs and 1 minute for hfm to execute the request in the deployment stage so this is how much time it takes to execute our all the request into target apps in the old world i can I can't, it, it used to take like day, day or two to execute this request. But again, those are the old days, but in the EPM where it's very straightforward in single screen, you can execute like entire request from end to end and you have perfect governance process and the logs as well. And we get a really good support from the EPM where itself, like if you get any challenges along the, along the way. And th that's about it, Abhi. Th thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jamin. Uh, yep. So, so folks on the on the call, um, I know we're going just a little bit over, but um, if you have any questions, you know, please um, drop them into the the question list. I see one one question out there. Uh, it says, "Can you schedule EPM where to deploy?" Sometimes we wanted to go through the approval process, but not go to the application until the end of the day, week or month, uh, depending on, on this, on the request, I guess. Uh, so, um, thanks for, for that question, Brian. And, uh, the, the answer to that question is, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Javen just showed us kind of what a, what a scheduled deployment would look like. Um, and I think what you can do is you can create either a scheduled deployment an ad hoc deployment by application or by request. Um, um, and, and it depends. Sometimes folks set up a, a scheduled for one application and they do an ad hoc for another application. Uh, and I think what, what Jim just spoke about is it's, it's very important to uh, be able to see all of that, the success or the failure from one uh, screen. And you know, you're, you're able to troubleshoot those items um, from that deployment module, but you're also able to see the uh, individual requests and whether it was successful or not to the target app. But yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, scheduling, um, you have quite a many different options uh, that you can take to push metadata um, based on how your calendar works. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions here. Um, and I know we're running a little over. So we'll, we'll start to uh, wrap up soon. Um, I think uh, what we'll do is um, EPMR website is epmr.com. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. More than happy to, you know, show you guys um, um, what we've done uh, and, and discuss some uh, further detailed use cases. Uh, Want to give a very very big thank you to uh, Lisa and to Jamin uh, for spending the time to to talk about their experience here with us. And um, thank you very much for folks that have joined and have a, have a wonderful day and have a wonderful weekend. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.